80% of my work is defending ambulance companies and fire departments when they get sued. Uh, I'm also an EMT and the fire chief down in Tully. So, Yay. Another <laughs> Southern City person. There you go. Uh, tonight's uh, topic is documentation. Um, I call it the good, the bad, and the ugly because there's good things, there's bad things, and then there's the really ugly things we're going to talk about a little bit tonight. Um, I know you guys use EMS charts. I make some references to electronic PCRs in this lecture. Some of this will be applicable to your <coughs> EMS charts. Generally, it will all be applicable. I haven't tried to dissect individual calls because of HIPAA concerns. They won't let me look at some of your past PCRs. So, uh, But there's some general things in here that are about uh, electronic PCRs in general that I think you'll find useful. So that's me. Uh, that's my office. My partner does regulatory work for ambulance companies. So if you want to buy an ambulance company, see her. If you screw up and get sued, see me. Um, they're, they're ours. So just so you guys know, we, we haven't changed them. Um, so obviously garbage in, garbage out. Uh, no amount of documentation can make up for bad patient care. So if you drop the tube in the wrong hole, and you don't recognize it, the patient's going to die, and I'm going to come to the gunfight with a checkbook, okay? Uh, that's pretty basic. Um, actual quotes from records. This is going to teach you to be careful about what you write. A uh, patient has chest pain. She lies on her left side for over a year. I probably would, too. Um, patient is done without oxygen for the past year. Not bad. We could probably send her to Mars. Um, Patient was in full code, whatever that is, C-O-A-D. Um, patient verbally refused transport while walking away to use the restroom. Refusal witnessed by her friend without further. Well, as a matter of fact, the patient was vomiting, complaining of a headache, and the EMT uh, did not want to walk in her vomit, so he assessed her from three feet away. She walked into the restroom to vomit again, her friend said, oh, well, I'll sign that piece of paper. The crew left, and 20 minutes later, they came back for a head wound. Um, and then the last one is not actually from a PCR. It's from a medical hospital record, but the patient refused an autopsy, which is one of my favorites. <laughs> so medical records have to be uh, documented in the regular course of business following normal routines, and that's going to be important because that makes them admissible in court without any, the fact that they're a business record makes them admissible in court without any further authenticity, authentication by, uh, by a person, uh, which means that your PCR can be used in court against you or your service, whether or not you're there to defend yourself. Um, needs to be generated at or near the time of matters recorded, and we're going to talk about that. Um, and it has to be created by an employer or provider with direct knowledge of the information documented. So obviously, as you learned in your first EMT classes, whenever that was, it's a legal document. Um, it also constitutes a party admission. So anything you write in there can and you will be used against you, or it can and will be used to defend you depending on how well you document your call. Uh, it's also admissible in court as a business record. So uh, it does not need to be uh, the, the hearsay, to the extent that a PCR contains hearsay, that's an exception to the hearsay rule because it's admissible as a business record. So uh, you need to be careful what you put in there about what other people said. So why does it matter? It's required by law. It protects the patient, continuity of care, and it protects you uh, as a provider in terms of defense. It also, uh, good documentation will help you get paid. Um, and so to the extent that uh, somebody thinks that a ALS call should have been a BLS call, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, or a private insurance company, Good documentation can mean the difference between getting that ALS reimbursement or that BLS reimbursement. Uh, provides, uh, it's a contemporaneous record, so it can be used to refresh your recollection later. Uh, it provides information about what happened, it provides information about who has knowledge, and it's required, it's relied upon by various audiences. So subsequent treating providers, Bureau of EMS investigators, 
persons with no medical knowledge, such as judges, juries, and lawyers. Um, so you want to make things clear in your documentation. Uh, so poor documentation can make good medical care look like bad medical care, okay? Uh, potential claims come to lawyers because of bad outcomes. They can turn into lawsuits because of bad documentation. Okay, a classic example of this, which we'll talk about, is cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest calls generate a lot of litigation. Why? Because people die. Why, just because people die, do cardiac arrest calls generate a lot of litigation? Because oftentimes there's a lot of guilt associated with that death. Either I should have made him stop smoking, I should have made him take his medicine, I should have made him lose weight, I should have made him go to the hospital earlier. I'm guilty. How can I assuage my guilt? I can blame somebody else. So lawyers get medical records and they scrutinize them and they can obtain medical records without you even knowing it. They can get the patient's chart from the ED, which may have a copy of your PCR in it, and they can scrutinize that record. They can show it to an expert. They can show it to an expert such as, I won't name any names, but Gary Ludwig in Missouri has been known to testify that he routinely brings back patients from cardiac arrest after 45 minutes of CPR. Obviously, he's testifying in favor of the person who's paying his bill. So, if it wasn't documented, it wasn't done. Everybody's heard that. It's not necessarily true, but it's routinely argued by plaintiff's attorneys. And not only do they argue that if it wasn't documented, it wasn't done, I have heard in a courtroom in Onondaga County, a lawyer suggests to a jury that if it wasn't documented, it not only wasn't done, but the paramedic didn't even know it had to be done. Okay? So my whole goal in, with regard to documentation is to make you look good. My whole goal in regards to if you get sued is to make you look good. When I get done with you on the witness stand, I want the jury thinking, why? If I went down right now, I'm glad he's in the courtroom. The plaintiff's whole goal is to make you look like an idiot. It's pretty much as simple as that. The plaintiff's goal is to make the jury think, I don't want that guy anywhere near me or anyone I care about. Okay? And good documentation can make a big difference in that. So there's two types of evidence. There's live testimony, which is the testimony given under oath on the witness stand, and there's documentary evidence such as your PCR. In addition, your PCR can be used to refresh your recollection. Um, you need to remember that statute of limitations in New York State for medical malpractice is 2.5 years from the date of the occurrence. If it's a pediatric call, it's 2.5 years from the date the pediatric patient turns 18 or 10 years, whichever comes first. So you could conceivably be looking at a piece, you could, could conceivably get sued over something you did 10 years ago or two and a half years ago. There is some debate among plaintiff's attorneys about whether the statute of limitations should be 2.5 years or three years because you're not really licensed medical providers the way doctors and nurses are, you're merely certified. Um, so that's somewhat of an open question, but you get the idea. There could have been a lot of calls that have gone by over the dam, under the bridge, however you want to phrase it, from the, from the time that you saw this call or the time you participated in this call or wrote that PCR. So if you think of it this way, a good PCR is like someone handing you a life vest or a life buoy and a bad PCR is like someone tying chains around your legs. Okay? And it's really pretty amazing. I have sat down with paramedics and said, if you're getting sued, look of panic. Here's your PCR. If it's a bad PCR, the look of panic deepens. If it's a good PCR, they get a look of relief. Not only do they remember that call, but frequently they'll say, oh yeah, I remember this call. The call before that was a really badly broken leg. And if I go back and pull all their PCRs from that day, the call before that was a really badly broken leg. You need to remember that in actuality, and I'm not sure the physiology of this because I'm not a neurologist, in actuality, I don't think you ever forget anything. It just gets lost in the random access memory of your brain. 
So it's things like good documentation that can pull those memories out, that can turn your testimony into reading from a PCR to actually reliving a call in front of the jury. So a PCR is a record of everything the, of the crew saw, heard, smelled, or felt during the, regarding the patient, heard from family members, said to the patient, measured all interventions, the result of those interventions, any communications with the hospital, medical control, who was present, especially other agencies, subjective complaints, using the patient's own words, objective observations, finding changes noted. So basically everything that goes on in the call. It also should document relevant environmental issues, which we'll talk about later, thorough medical history, medications, mental status, decisional capacity, especially with refusals, and we'll talk about refusals in a little while. Relevant advanced directives and the source for same information relevant to the patient's informed consent and anyone you spoke to during the call. In addition, the PCR should also document any problems, okay? A constant problem that I have in litigation is the monitor crapped the bed. You look at the PCR, there's nowhere on that PCR can you tell the monitor to crap the bed, only you have a family member who remembers somebody on the radio calling for another monitor. And you find out, guess what, the monitor crap, did crap the bed. It's not recorded anywhere on the PCR. You are much better off putting down what went wrong, why it went wrong, and how you overcame that problem than you are completely ignoring it. <coughs> So, a little uh, mnemonic device, tactful documentation. I stole this from somebody else. It's not my idea, but it works. Um, timely, accurate, complete, true, factual, understandable, and legible. Um, so, timely. They should be completed at the hospital or soon, as soon thereafter as call volume permits, and they should be transmitted to the hospital as soon as possible. Okay? This is a true story. Crews dispatch for a patient down. They arrive and find a highly intoxicated patient. He admits to having consumed 12 beers and 0.5 grams of cocaine. He's got an EKG change and a, hist and a cardiac history. He has a facial abrasion. He does not want to go to the hospital. The patient has some complaints of numbness and tingling. Crew elects to transport him in a position of comfort because they're concerned that if they try to board and collar this guy, he's either going to get excited, and if he gets excited, he's going to go into some sort of bad arrhythmia because of the cocaine he's got on board. They transport him to the hospital. They arrive at 0126, and they give a complete report to the ED staff. Uh, you can't really read that. I apologize for that. But what you can, what that says is that. Um, at about uh, 2.20, 2.30, patient complains he can't move his legs. Okay. Um, and I'll come back to the slide in a minute, but if you look at the fax time on the PCR, the PCR didn't arrive in the ED until 0301. So now I have a hospital saying, we didn't know all that stuff on the PCR. We don't remember getting the complete report about numbness and tingling from the crew. Well, it was on the PCR. Oh, well, we didn't get the PCR until an hour after his, le or half an hour after he couldn't move his legs. Now I have a lawsuit in which I'm named and the hospital is named and the patient's a, a quadriplegic. Now, fortunately, I'm sorry this isn't blown up, but fortunately the hospital did some good documentation because in that second line there, if you could read it, it basically says after he couldn't move his legs, they put a collar on him and he was highly intoxicated still and he kept sitting up and pulling at the collar and laughing and saying, get this damn thing off me and twisting his head around. So uh, the hospital kind of saved both providers uh, a little uh, potentially a lot of problems by documenting a call well. So then we move on to accuracy. Accuracy is key. Um, it's the patient's right and left, not yours. 
need to be careful with medical terms, such as <coughs> distal and proximal. If you're estimating something, make sure you estimate something as, make sure you document that it is an estimate. That goes for speed, it goes for distance, it goes for time, it goes for blood loss. Um, if you write in your PCR, blood loss was one liter, or 25 cc's, or 100 cc's, or whatever you write down, that's going to be taken by the plaintiff's attorney as fact. If you write down it was approximately, that gives you some leeway so that you can say, look, I'm estimating this from a pool of blood on the floor. That's what I wrote in my PCR as an estimate. Avoid using vague terms like family member, caregiver, or sister. The patient could have four sisters. If a family member is there giving you information, uh, signing a refusal for an incompetent patient, make sure you get the family member's full name. Same thing with caregivers. If you're at a facility, you get a caregiver, get the first and last name of the caregiver because two or three or four or five years from now, when this case is going to trial, that caregiver may be, have moved way on, they may not even be in the same state, and uh, you may need to track them down. So complete, be thorough, uh, obviously vital signs consist of blood, pulse, blood pressure, respiration, skin color, and temperature. Uh, pulse and respiration should include rate and quality. If you record something like SpO2 on one set of vitals, do it on every single set of vitals because if you don't and there's a change between the first time you do it and the last time you do it or the first time you do it and it doesn't get done again until you're in the hospital and it's significantly uh, worsened and the hospital reading is significantly lower than your reading, then someone's going to be on your case about why you didn't document having watched that SpO2 carefully. Um, Describe the patient, the patient's appearance completely. Paint a picture. Okay, this is not only going to be used. I mean, you know that the number of times the doctor actually says, oh, thank you very much for this PCR, and sits there and reads it carefully, are very few and far between, okay? If ever. The doctor or the nurse takes your oral report, and usually the nurse, the doctor usually doesn't really care what your report is because they're going to look at the patient and make draw their own conclusions. However, I can guarantee you, because I have heard it time after time after time on cross-examination on the stand, if you screw up something in your documentation, the plaintiff's attorney is going to be sitting there holding that PCR up, or actually they'll have it blown up to poster size, and they're going to be pointing to all the deficiencies and saying, don't you think the doctors would have liked to have known this? Don't you think the doctors would have liked to have known that? The jury, maybe not knowing any better, is going to believe them or might believe them. True. You have to be completely truthful. Never ever document something you did not do or otherwise lie on a PCR. If you ask any EMS investigator, they will work with you on patient care issues most of the time unless you're actually out there killing people. If you lie on a PCR, that is the number one way of getting your card yanked in a heartbeat. Okay. They will not tolerate lying or being untruthful on a PCR. And again, if something goes wrong, document it and explain what you did to fix it. Factual. Joe Friday used to say just the facts. I'm probably dating myself by that, but I think there was another movie <laughs> more recently. So um, it should be a factual document. Don't editorialize. Don't speculate. Um, record factual information accurately and properly. Obviously, your assessment or your presumptive diagnosis is somewhat of an opinion, but you need to make that clear and that it's based on your factual opinions. Um, do not ever, ever, ever use the word diagnose, okay? In my world, EMS does not diagnose. Doctors diagnose. EMS assesses. EMS makes a presumptive diagnosis made uh, based on an assessment. EMS can make an educated uh, calculation as to what's wrong with the patient. You can use any word you want to to describe that, but never use the word diagnose because that's something doctors do. Um, you don't have x-ray machines, you don't have ultrasounds, you don't have any of the equipment, you don't have a lab 
So even though you may be positive what's going on, what your PCR is going to say is that's an assessment, it's not a diagnosis. So don't ever say, I, you know, in a narrative, for example, I diagnose the patient as having an ST elevation MI. Based on the, uh, based on the, what I was observing on a cardiac monitor, the patient appeared to have an ST elevation MI. I advised the hospital of same and asked them to prepare the cath lab, okay? Understandable. Uh, be clear and concise. Use only approved abbreviations. Use complete sentences where possible. Use good grammar, okay? Again, this is part of uh, making, this is part of helping you appear more competent to the jury. Uh, as you saw in that first, one of those first slides, spelling the word code, C-O-A-D, is not going to help the jury feel confident about your ability to help somebody. Um, saying things like ain't, saying things like CPR was began at 2200 doesn't help the jury feel that you're a competent, educated, experienced provider. And that's the impression that you want to give them. Uh, and again, uh, if you try to use the same narrative format every time, it'll get to be habit. So whether you're using it in, in a, whether you're writing Shakespeare or whether you're using a, a sample mnemonic and just filling in the details at both ends of it, try to use the same narrative or the same style of doing your PCRs every single time because then it will become automatic and it'll be a lot easier for you to, to make sure that you completely document things. <coughs> and again, remember, you might be looking at that PCR up to three years or even more late from when you're actually writing it. So legible, obviously electronic PCRs are a big help in this regard, but anything that you write, handwrite, you need to make it legible. Uh, nothing makes for longer moments for your attorney than to sit on and behind the counsel table while the seconds tick by, while a, a paramedic or an EMT uh, stares at something they wrote five years ago and tries to decipher what, what it said. So um, anything that you do, make it legible and understandable. Um, and finally, be tactful. You can describe fully and accurately what you find, but you know, don't use a PCR as an opportunity to criticize your patient's lifestyle, their customs, their dress, their housekeeping, their significant other, their family, their parenting style. Um, doesn't mean you shouldn't report <coughs> details about the environment in which you find your patient, but do it in a tactful way and don't editorialize about your patient while you're doing it. Keep, as Joe Friday said, just the facts. Keep your opinions to yourself. So electronic PCRs, uh, you know, the good, they resolve many of the problems that paper PCRs had. The entries are always le legible. Spell check is usually available. Abbreviations are often uniform. Symbols are uniform. Monitor data can be stored with the PCR, etc. Um, can be cardiac monitor data can be retrieved often, regardless of what happened to the paper strip. It can be stored in penthouse servers, backed up physically in the cloud. They can be transmitted electronically to the hospital. And they can be set up to require you, you to populate certain fields before you move on, which is all good. Um, obviously, anytime there's good, there's bad. Um, downside to ePCRs is hacking, loss of devices, catastrophic failures of systems. Um, more bad drop-down boxes. Um, one of my pet peeves, we'll, we'll talk about that more uh, going forward, but uh, it limits your descriptive ability. The options are often determined by the software writer who may or may not necessarily be uh, attuned to what you go through in the field. Uh, they sometimes limit accuracy because they, you end up having to pick the closest one. Um, the drop-down boxes and all of the data, the chrono chronological data of a PCR tends to uh, take the place of a narrative description. We're going to talk about that more in a little while. Um, and then some PCRs, the, the drop-down boxes default to a normal reading. So if you don't fill in a drop-down box, it can default to a normal reading. That gives you a, a potential for inconsistency 
and sometimes PCRs timestamp something when you document it, uh, it can cause for uh, unpleasant and inaccurate timelines. So ugliness, um, automatic timestamps, um, intended to provide a chronology of the events that occur in a call. Many providers rely totally on the PCR to record times various interventions are performed and it can produce ugly results. So on this PCR, the patient is noted to be in cardiac arrest at 10.55 and the first note about performing CPR comes at 0, or at 0 0.355, the patient is noted to be in cardiac arrest. The first notation on the PCR that CPR is in progress comes at 0404. So uh, the plaintiff's attorney is going to tell the jury, no matter what you have testified to in terms of how as soon as you noticed that the patient was in cardiac arrest, you directed your EMT to start compressions, you, did, you directed a firefighter on scene to start compression, they're going to tell the jury that nine minutes went by without any CPR being performed. And in that nine minutes, my client, Mrs. Smith's husband's brain was irreparably damaged, which led to his death, and it's your fault. Okay? So if you started CPR immediately somewhere in that PCR, you need to, if you started CPR, you need to note that you started it immediately. Um, and if that means you have to enter the times manually, then you have to do that. Okay, <clears throat> the successful intervention. That's another one of my pet peeves. I, I don't know if your charts do that, but many key PCRs include an outcome for each intervention, an intervention and it will document whether it's successful or unsuccessful. And it can lead to some inadvertent but ugly documentation. So, in this call, they defibrillated a patient who was in V-fib, and the patient ended up in PEA, documented as a successful defibrillation. That's not successful in my book. Okay, you just took a shockable rhythm, and you shocked them, and they ended up in an unshockable rhythm. Not successful, and the, the medic in this particular case got grilled at a deposition over why he termed that defibrillation successful. So you need to be very careful about what you call successful uh, and what you call not successful. Again, the addendum, sometimes addendums are necessary. There is important information that got left out. Information came to your attention afterwards. You do need to be careful about how that gets added to the PCR because some PCRs enable addendums or notations to be added after a call. They're gray areas because it's a little bit gray as to whether that's a part of the patient's chart and needs to be, uh, it's, it's disclosable and you're required to disclose it upon a discovery demand or a subpoena, or are some of those notes actually QA, QI notes which should be privileged? Well, if they're used for some other purpose or if they're used, if they're stored in some place that is not a dedicated QA, QI file, most judges are going to tell the plaintiff you can have that information. So QA, QI has to be totally segregated. If I have a case and the, and the paramedic, and it's been QA, QI, and the paramedic wrote a statement for the QA, QI, I don't even show that statement to the medic when I'm preparing them for a deposition because now I've used that privileged information which was privileged because it's supposed to be used solely to learn from your mistakes, and I've used it to refresh their recollection before a deposition. That makes it discoverable. And if the plaintiff's attorney says, did you review anything before coming to today's deposition? Oh yes, I reviewed my, the statement I gave to the QA committee. Out will come his hand, you'll go home until he can get a court order to get that statement. And here's the problem, okay? Here is a PCR in which the supervisor added an addendum noting that the BLS standard was not followed. Oops, okay? Uh, talk about a party admission. They just admitted that they didn't follow the BLS standard. Also, uh, if you note, patient got back pulses and ED and was sent to the cath lab. Great job, Joe. 
Compliments like criticisms have no place in the PCR. Note the previous, the great job Joe comp comment on the previous PCR. The lawsuit is captioned the estate of blank versus blank ambulance Inc. Obviously the family did not think that Joe did a great job. So um, that's the sort of thing that um, plaintiff's attorneys love to find because when they find something like that, they can beat you over the head with it, and they can get the jury angry about it, okay? Um, getting lost. Getting lost is not negligent. A very well-known EMS expert says, ambulances get lost on the way to calls every day in this country, so getting lost is part of normal EMS operations. What can be negligent is what you do after you realize you're lost, okay? Um, and again, this goes along with what you do when, you're, when something goes wrong. So true story number two is a very bad day, worse for the patient for, than for the crew, but uh, the crew is going to end up having a couple of bad days when they go to court. 1420, an ALS crew is dispatched to a call located seven minutes away from their station. It calls for heart problems. Crew plugs the address into their GPS and proceeds lights and sirens, and the GPS promptly takes them to an identical address in an adjoining town. Same number, exactly identical street, wrong town. On arrival at the wrong address, the crew calls their supervisor on a cell phone. The supervisor provides them with the directions, and they arrive at the correct location 25 minutes after going en route. Whereupon an angry family member meets them and tells them another service is already on the scene. Crew departs the scene and, pre and prepares the following PCR. One page. Uh, a, little, a little bit difficult to read there, but. Um, so the rest of the story. The initial call came in as a 49-year-old male who had been on the roof working, came in complaining of generalized chest pain and is now unresponsive, snoring and drooling. Neither the crew nor the supervisor ever contacted the 911 center and asked that another rig be dispatched. Another ALS fully staffed rig belonging to another service was located two-tenths of a mile and one minute away. In fact, one of the family members drove over there and asked them to come over. The family called the 911 center back three times and asked where the first time it was began, the word began with an H and ended with an L, the second time it began with an F and ended with a G, okay? Um, <laughs> note the PCR indicates canceled by family, no patient contact. <clears throat> Responses affecting care, response factors affecting care, the only thing they wrote was directions. Dispatch factors, none. So let's look at that. How about, instead of canceled by family, no patient contact, how about a complete description of everything the crew did from the moment it received the dispatch? Again, it's not their fault that their GPS took them to the wrong location. The dispatcher never gave them a cross street. Okay? They could have asked for a cross street, but the dispatcher didn't give it to them. I would even <coughs> consider taking a screenshot of the GPS or taking a picture of it with my cell phone so I could prove to somebody that I input the proper address into the GPS. Document the call of the supervisor and document the exchange had with a family member who had actually threatened physical harm to the crew. Response factors uh, affecting care directions. What the heck does that mean? Okay. If it's a drop-down box, you need to talk to your software provider to the extent that the box will only allow directions to be, to the extent that it allows you to enter a narrative, the whole sad story should be entered in that area. And if, the, if all you can do is uh, put in the word directions, then you need to add an explanation somewhere on that PCR because that directions is going to be a great big red flag to a plaintiff's attorney. And in fact, it was. This is a lawsuit. Dispatch factors, none. Thank you, crew. You just absolved the 911 center of all their responsibility, okay? How about the fact the county had a policy of alternating dispatch between services, okay? If you listen to the 911 tape on this call, 
you hear the phone ring, you hear the dispatcher pick up and say, 911, what is your emergency? And you hear the patient's daughter say, I think my father is having a heart attack. And the first words out of the dispatcher's mouth are, um, okay, could you hang on a minute? 17 seconds later, he comes back on the line and says, what's your preference? She doesn't have a clue what that means. And uh, when she says she does not have a preference, he dispatches the next ambulance service up, rather than the one that's two tenths of a mile away. How about the fact that there was, there were three callbacks from that location to the 911 dispatcher, and the 911 dispatcher never thought about dispatching that closer rig. And then how about the fact that despite being told the patient was unresponsive, snoring, and drooling, the 911 dispatcher didn't provide any pre-arrivals. So these are all things that you need to think about before you say, oh no, there weren't any dispatch factors involved in this call. If you don't know what dispatch factors were involved, don't write none, write I don't know. If you know what dispatcher fa dispatch factors were involved, then you should consider making a complete report of that because um, I've been trying to convince the uh, local attorney to third party in the county as another defendant in this case um, on that basis. So drop down boxes uh, can provide preset responses. They can be useful. They, they uh, won't let you proceed until the field is filled. Uh, but they can also yield ugly results. Um, so on this particular call, uh, you see on Neurologic, on ABPU, they, the, they note that the patient is alert. And then directly below that, they note a GCS of eight. Okay. Hmm. Um, on this one, they note the patient is alert on a GCS of three. Okay, how does that happen? Um, again, it's going to be pretty clear in the, in the grand scheme of the case that this patient was, in this particular case, was in cardiac arrest and they had a GCS of three because they were unresponsive, apneic, and pulseless, and they were nowhere close to being alert. However, you're going to get dragged through the mud by the plaintiff's attorney because they're going to make it seem like you didn't know the difference, okay? So, uh, you know, if the field autofills with a normal value, you need to be alert to that. If they, sh if they don't, or if they do, then you need to make sure to fill them in manually, and you need to check them all at the, when you're done with your PCR before you close it out or upload it or download it or whatever you do, you need to check all of your times, all of your entries for consistency and look to make sure that you're being consistent with things like alert uh, GCS uh, because the plaintiff's attorney is gonna use that however he wants. If he wants the patient to have been alert and, and you to have missed that, then he'll focus on that. If he wants the patient to be out cold or comatose and say that you missed that because you, you said they were alert, then he's going to focus on that. Either way, you're going to come across looking bad. Code summaries, another one of my pet peeves, okay? I can't tell you the number of cases where uh, a code summary would have saved the day because it would have been, I have a medic, perfectly competent medic who's telling me exactly everything that that patient's heart did, all the arrhythmias that they went through over the course of a call, but nobody retained a code summary. Um, and so it makes it very difficult to prove. I have another call, another case, a getting lost case, where I have good documentation on everything the crew did to, to uh, get themselves to the scene, including calling for another rig to be dispatched, calling for an ALS fly car to be dispatched, um, and the state police were there with an AED. And the state police being anal save everything. So I have a complete download from the state police AED that shows this patient was shocked five times with no result prior to the arrival of the first ALS crew. That's going to be of enormous help with my defense, which is 
that by the time any ALS provider could have gotten to this patient, they were too much time had passed for there to be any brain activity left. So they should be retained on full arrest calls, suspected cardiac calls, anytime you do a 12 lead, anytime you have EKG changes, all intubations, and anytime you think it should be, follow your gut. Um, I've heard all the excuses. Monitor paper is expensive. We can't afford memory cards. It gets stored in the monitor for 30 days. We download it if we think there was a problem on that call. And my favorite, code summary? What's that? Okay. Um, so, you know, if you're not uploading, downloading, or printing code summaries, you should start. Because what will you do if the family of the decedent claims you never shocked the patient? What do you do if the tube dislodges on the ED bed and the ED staff blames you for the tube being bad? And if you don't think they do that, they'll do it in a heartbeat, okay? Or you're getting close to the hospital, you go to switch to the portable tank, somebody in the rig says, that one's empty, and a family member hears it and later testifies in a deposition that you ran out of oxygen, right? So, code summary can show demonstrate clearly for the jury and hopefully for the plaintiff's expert, and maybe the lawsuit won't ever occur, that the patient was never in a shockable rhythm. Code summary can show good capnography right up until the time the patient's on the ED bed. And you know that you reached in the cabinet and got the full O2 bottle, but the code summary will show good SpO2s all the way to the hospital. So code summaries are like that life ring being tossed to you. Another one of my pet peeves is narratives, okay? Paper PCR has forced you to write down everything that occurred on a call in some form, sort of narrative form. A lot of, a lot of uh, PCRs have replaced that with drop-down boxes or small fields that can be populated by one or two words or the, the, code chrono or the call chronology that, that you know, provides all the information vitals, interventions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in a chronological fashion. But in my view, as a lawyer, nothing, nothing will ever replace a narrative for documenting a call. So what goes into a good narrative? In a couple of words, everything else, okay? Any information that you think might be relevant, anything, any information that you think is relevant, environmental factors, statements made, observations, observations of trends that might not be compressible or anything that is not, uh, anything that is contained in a drop-down box that you don't think the drop-down box fully describes, then you should put that in a narrative. Okay, so here's a scenario. You're being sued because a 56-year-old male patient went into a cardiac arrest in the back of your ambulance while transporting to the hospital. The family claims you delayed on scene, took a longer route than you should have to reach the ED. The suit is not filed until two years after the call. So what do you think is going to be more helpful to you in defending what you did? Narrative number one, 56-year-old male complaining of shortness of breath, transported to hospital via stretcher, and route to hospital patient went into cardiac arrest, intubated, IVA, CLSs for PCR, arrived at St. Joe's with CPR in progress. Okay. That's actually good. I've actually seen a PCR in which someone wrote for the entire cardiac arrest, cardiac arrest, that's what the entire PCR contained, and one set of vitals, zero, zero, zero. Or narrative number two. Now, this is obviously a, a somewhat of a novel, and this is why my driver doesn't like me uh, when I am the EMT on Thursday nights, because I tend to write a lot, and in Tully we still use PCRs, so, uh, but he keeps telling me, are you done yet? And I keep saying, no, I'm not done yet. Somebody might sue me someday. <laughs> but uh, just to pull out the pertinent information of this, uh, patient's sister Nancy was smoking and stated her brother smokes heavily, uh, cigarette butts filling the room. The patient stated he was having one of his spells, didn't want to go to the hospital or any treatment. Repeatedly asked his sister for a cigarette. Uh, Ten minutes of convincing the patient to let them perform an assessment. They perform an ALS assessment. Uh, noted SD elevations. En route to the hospital, his O2 sets dropped. Uh, 
uh, he suddenly stated, don't let me die, lost consciousness. Uh, CPR was started by the firefighter. The patient was intubated. Documents good waveform capnography. Um, en route to St. Joe's found usual route blocked by accident. Delay of approximately four minutes caused by having to take a different route. So, obviously I made this one up, so uh, <laughs> I could cover all my bases, but. So, if you had to read that PCR, though, two years after the call, which, was, which would be more likely to refresh your recollection? Which would be more likely to let that light go off in your head and say, oh yeah, I remember this call. That was a real pain in the butt because the guy did not want to go. He did not even want to let me touch him even though he was sitting there sweating and pale. So the second narrative establishes for the court uh, and the defense, there's a two hour delay in care while the sister and brother <coughs> argued about calling 911 in the first place. There's an additional 10 minute delay in convincing the patient to let them assess him. There's evidence that the decedent smoked up into nearly the last hour of his life. Uh, and there's an explanation noted as to why there was a delay en route to the hospital. So that whole call of delay, uh, that whole claim of delay en route to the hospital suddenly turns into, geez, are you telling me that it turns into allowing me to be the aggressor on the plaintiff's expert by saying, are you telling me that that four minute delay, which was totally outside my client's control, was the difference between this patient living and dying when for two hours and 10 minutes he argued with his wife about going, argued with his wife and then, about, and then with my crew about going to the hospital in the first place? So it makes my job a lot easier and it makes your life a lot uh, less stressful. Also, good narratives can protect a patient, too. So you know, if you describe entering the home of a 94-year-old woman suffering from dehydration and describe in your PCR that it's unbearably hot, there's no AC, there's no food in the refrigerator, that might help social services or the woman's family get her into an assisted living facility where she can be taken care of if she can no longer take care of herself. Good description of an interior of a house can uh, might help uh, going to help support a report of suspected child abuse or a child neglect and it could help get a child out of a dangerous situation or a good description of damage to the car uh, written in your PCR but also relayed to the ER might cause a resident who might not otherwise think of it to do an ultrasound and discover a tamponaded liver lack uh, that uh, could have been fatal. So uh, good narratives and good descriptions of everything that you think is relevant to the care of the patient and to the call uh, can actually help your patient as well. But where do I put the narrative? The answer is anywhere you can, okay? Um, I know a lot of people use the history of the present illness box because it, it lets you, I think it lets you write as much as you want. Um, there may be an actual narrative block that, that you can fill in. If there's no narrative block that you can fill in, I would strongly suggest you go to your, whoever does your, uh, whoever is your provider of EPCRs and suggest to them that they add a narrative box to the EPCR. Uh, one of the problems with, with a lot of the narrative boxes on EPCRs and EPCRs in general is you cannot, you can't see the whole thing. So it makes it difficult, it makes it, it makes it difficult and therefore it makes you less likely to do it, to proofread the whole thing. It makes it difficult for you to look back and see what you've already written. So if I was designing an EPCR, I would have it be a whole page so that you could read the whole thing. Electronics can do anything. Computer can be, you can compress it back into that little box, but I would design an EPCR so that it opened up so that you could see everything that you wrote at once, which would help you be consistent and would help you make sure you didn't leave anything out. Okay, refusals. Um, refusals are another big problem in EMS, another huge source of litigation. Um, I can guarantee you that the patient, or more usually the patient's surviving family members, will never recall uh, receiving informed consent. They'll deny that the signature belongs to anybody alive or dead. Uh, they'll always claim the patient was talked out of going by the crew always claim that they were afraid to call back because the crew made it clear that they didn't want to be bothered again. Um, 
most people don't realize that we don't get paid unless we take them to the hospital. So that's one big incentive for, for taking people. But uh, I can't tell you the number of times that I've heard plaintiffs <coughs> sit in a deposition or on a witness stand and tell me, oh no, they didn't want to have anything to do with us. It was late at night. They were obviously, you know, they wanted to get back home or do whatever they wanted to do. They talked me out of going. <coughs> So obviously documentation is key to any refusal. You have to follow the, the regional and, and your services refusal protocol exactly. You need to document everything that you told your patient and the patient's family and everything the family said to you, quoting words exactly where possible. Um, don't mince words, okay? Use words and phrases such as life-threatening, death, you could die, and put that in your PCR. I inform the patient that his shortness of breath could be an indication of a life-threatening condition and that he could die suddenly and without warning. Um, take the time to explain to the patient and the family in simple, easy to understand terms why you think they should go to the hospital. Get a supervisor, medical control, if necessary, and it's during the day, the patient's family doctor, somebody to speak with the patient, and get an unrelated party, law enforcement, fire, neighbor, or somebody else other than the patient, patient family member to sign as a witness. You also have to document the patient's ability to understand what they're doing. So remember, the standard is informed consent. Um, and you're gonna, as you know, you run into a wide variety of people, a wide variety of intelligence levels, a wide variety of education, um, if there's a language barrier, find somebody to translate or use a service to translate. If they appear to be incompetent and the family member is appearing to act on their behalf, make sure that they are, they have the authority to act on the patient's uh, behalf. So if it's a healthcare proxy or a guardianship, make sure you see some evidence of that. And if they have no evidence of that, I would be very hesitant to leave the patient patient admits to even having one alcoholic beverage or smells of alcohol, document how you ascertain that the patient was competent to refuse care. Okay, so you need to learn to use words like judgment. So for example, patient stated he had one beer, uh, patient smelled slightly of an alcoholic beverage, however, in my judgment, the patient appeared competent and able to make a decision to refuse care. The patient indicated that he understood everything I said to him. The patient spoke with my supervisors. The patient spoke with medical control, whatever it is. Uh, but document the heck out of it. Uh, consider requesting law enforcement to perform a Section 941 arrest if the patient appears incompetent or a danger to himself or others. Um, they refuse to do it. Document the officer's name and badge number. He or she may not like it, but it may save your bacon. Okay, and that goes uh, true of, of anything law enforcement does. I had a, a, a call once in Tully where I arrived on scene and the patient had rolled their car and he's standing there in handcuffs and he's complaining of back pain. This was back in the days when we backboarded people. And his hands were handcuffed behind him and I asked the state trooper if he could please handcuff his hands in front of him so we could backboard him and collar him. And the state trooper said to me, Fuck him, I don't give a shit if he's paralyzed, he took a swing at me. I wrote in my PCR, I asked Trooper to uncuff him so I could backboard him and collar him, and Trooper, fill in the blank, said, quote, fuck him, he took a swing at me, I don't care if he's paralyzed. And then I transported him in a position of comfort. I wasn't gonna take the fall for that kid. I can't, I can't take the cuffs off myself, so. So refusal should be an exception, not the rule. In the words of Chris Thompson, you call the hall. You need to think of every uh, refusal as a potential lawsuit, okay? They're, they're just a, they're a problem waiting to happen. Uh, final words, keep calm and document everything. Uh, question? Stephen, we are doing an assessment yeah. I notice a lot of a lot of people utilize the drop down boxes. I want to talk about utilizing descriptive like 
pertinent and negatives and how important they are sure. in your in your description. Um, because I, I think we all fall victim to the drop down boxes sometimes. And you know, we make generalized statements like chest pain without, you know, descriptors, without quality, without radiation, without, you know, the presence of recent illness or fever or things like that. How important are those pertinent negatives in there, I mean, they're very important because, again, they're going to provide you with the, the more information that you have about the patient's condition is, is going to provide, well, A, it's going to provide you with the ability to provide better patient care. Um, B, it's going to um, provide you uh, with, assuming that you gave that same report to the ED, and if someone if that report isn't uh, isn't quoted or paraphrased properly in the ED, and there's a question about some piece of information that wasn't passed along, uh, even though the doctors don't read it, if that PCR got to the ED relatively contemporaneously with your transport of the patient, then that becomes part of the patient's chart, and the doctor has a responsibility at that point to have read it, whether they did or not. Um, so anything that you can write down in terms of, uh, you know, if it's something that, that's bother, if it's if it's an actual pertinent negative or if it's even something that's bothering you, then I think you should document it. So for example, you know, 47, well, let's, let's make it even a 37-year-old complaining of chest pain states he's been at the gym bench pressing. Okay, so there is a potential reason for chest pain right there. However, the patient appears pale, diaphoretic, and states uh, father died of an MI at uh, 42. So bingo, all kinds of red flags go up. Um, you know, as Tim Sopransky from Rochester used to say, no one ever believes that a 25-year-old can drop dead of a heart attack in front of them until they do. And so. Uh, Again, you know, when, when something goes wrong or when that patient has a bad outcome, um, the, what's going to help you on the witness, what's going to help you is anything that helps trigger your recollection of the call. And what's going to help you on the witness stand is the more thorough that you were in your assessment as proved by your documentation, again, the more likely it is that the jurors are going to come away thinking, Boy, that's the guy I want coming to my house. And if they come away from that, from your testimony, thinking that's the guy I want coming to my house, chances are they're not going to find that you were negligent. Uh, and so that becomes extremely important. Now, if we have a night like tonight, you know, you hear the tongues hit multiple times. We're on a call. It's, it's a critical call. We come back, we get in service, we automatically get dispatched. Should we be putting that somewhere in the narrative of the call that there was a delay in the documentation because you know you got dispatched to another call, for example. Yeah, I would I would definitely consider doing that because again, you know, if you're if you're having a night where you get banged out for a call at, at six o'clock and then you get banged out for four more calls consecutively, so you're not getting the right and transmit this PCR until 11 o'clock or midnight, then you know, you're definitely going to want to put that on your PCR because, again, if the plaintiff's attorney says, well, don't you have a duty to, to document contemporaneously? Yes, I do. Well, you didn't do that in this case. No, but may I explain? The plaintiff's attorney will never let you explain, okay? But when I go to do my redirect, I'll say, well, the plaintiff's attorney wasn't very interested in your explanation, but I am, and I'm sure the jury is. Can you tell us what you were going to explain? Yes, I was busy saving five other lives that night, and so I didn't physically have the time to complete my documentation, and I made that note in, in the, when I did, when I finally did get to do the documentation, I made note of that fact. See, we're doing, you know, as you know, the state requires that you leave something, okay, at the at the hospital if you can't 
do right. the EPCR immediately. So we're doing um, a giving an assessment, like a summary form, okay, of basically the kind of brief description of what we did. Um, and we have a, a hospital staff person sign that, that they received it. It's a, 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 um, a carbon a, carbonized form, so they right. get the original, we get the copy. We've been attaching that to our PCR. Is that a good thing, a bad thing? Yeah, I would, okay. I would do that. I mean, you, you need to keep all that documentation together. And uh, again, if you're attaching it, are you attaching it to the PCR and then transmitting it again to the hospital? No. Okay. But no. you're keeping no. it as your record attached to the PCR. Correct. Absolutely. I mean that's okay. gonna be discoverable and it's it's a record created for this patient uh, in the regular course of your business and it's in the regular your course of it is in the regular course of your business to maintain such a record. So that's a patient record and needs to be maintained along with all the other patient records um, as long as you would maintain them. And the other reason you want to keep that with the patient record is because that that piece of paper is going to end up in the hospital record somewhere and so when, when the patient when the plaintiff's attorney gets the hospital records that piece of paper is going to show up and then if they come and they get your records and that piece of paper is not there then they're going to say whoa wait a minute what are you hiding on us so again from my perspective as a lawyer um, if you screwed up, you screwed up, okay? Uh, and it's much easier for me to resolve the case uh, quickly and without a lot of publicity. Uh, but if you didn't screw up, your PCR becomes the best shield or the best sword or the best both that you ever had because it allows me to defend what you did. Because I'll tell you right now, the first thing that I do when I get a case is I try to create a second-by-second second timeline of everything that occurred on that call, okay? So, for example, I've seen plaintiff's attorneys take their expert and he sits on the witness stand and says, well, intubation is easy. And he's got a laryngoscope in his left hand, he's got a tube in his right hand, and he says, all you do is you slip the laryngoscope into the patient's mouth, you lift the tongue out of the way, you visualize the tube, and you put the tube in. It takes like three seconds on the witness stand. I've actually put a, a, a dummy on the floor of the courtroom in front of the jury, <coughs> had the medic start at the door of the courtroom with everything strapped to the gurney, come into the courtroom, take everything off, assess the patient, get out the airway bag, assemble the laryngoscope, and intubate a patient so I can show the jury that it doesn't take three or four seconds. Okay, It takes more time than that if you're doing if you're doing it in real life. And then I can tell the jury that that doctor has probably never intubated somebody with a Doberman growling at him, and he's probably never intubated somebody jammed between a bathtub and a toilet. Okay, so um, the, more, the more you and I on the witness stand together can teach the jury what you do. Okay, I always try to come across to the jury as a teacher, and I want you to become, become the teacher. I'll get you off the witness stand and demonstrating things showing things on charts, demonstrating your equipment, anything I can do to let the jury see how competent you are. And believe me, we'll practice it till you're blue in the face before we ever go into court. But um, so that the jury trusts that you know what you're talking about. And that's the key thing, okay? Um, the uh, same thing with, uh, with, you know, the timeline is so important because as you know, in cardiac arrest, every second counts. <coughs> I get wrongful death cases frequently because bad things happen to people. That's why they call 911. In fact, what I generally, what I often tell the jury in my closing argument, the first words out of my mouth is nobody calls 911 when they're having a good day. So we're starting way down here, and we're not trying to get somebody up here. We're only trying to get them to the hospital as good or better, hopefully better shape than we found them. But the timeline becomes important because every minute that passes, that's not our fault, is, a, is some brain cells that died, not our fault, okay? And so if we can show that the, the person's dead, okay, it's not our problem that, that 
like for example in Tully, it's not my problem that someone chooses to live in Atisco. Okay. Um, if you live on the backside of Strong Road in Tully, there's gonna it's gonna be 12 minutes before the paramedic gets to you, even if he is sitting in the medic car with the engine running when the call comes in, because it just takes that long to get there. Um, you know that, the, and it's explaining to the jury why that 12 minutes matters and how it is that you can't control that 12 minutes. So we will take responsibility for the things we can control and hopefully be able to explain everything that you did using your well-documented PCR. Uh, but another part of that is explaining to the jury what you can't control. And so again, you know, when, before you go to a deposition, you and I will sit down and go over all the anatomy and physiology, okay? Because you would be amazed at the number of times, I, I act as a consultant, so a lot of times I'm, I'm only coming into cases right before they go to trial, and I'm acting as a consultant to try to, on cases around the country, to, to try to see how I could help the local attorney. And you would be surprised at the number of times I see paramedics or EMTs who went through a deposition and they didn't really, they weren't really sharp on the anatomy or the physiology. And again, if you make a mistake and use distal, use a medical term wrong in your PCR, it gives, a, it's a red light, a red flag for the plaintiff's attorney to drill down at your lack of knowledge. Um, if you did make a mistake, we'll admit it, but the more that you can show that you're competent, through your documentation and then again through your presentation, which your documentation will help because it will help bring back the whole call to you, the better presentation you'll make on the stand. Sure. Yes. In the PCR, what are your feelings in regards to disabling those drop down boxes and treatment? If I could do it, I would, but then we still <laughs> use paper and Tully, so. Um, can, I, can I make a comment about that and why those are there? Pardon? When it comes to, um, like with the state bridge side of things, from a data standpoint, from what needs to be reported to New York State and to the National Trauma Registry and all that stuff, those drop down boxes, and this is the key thing we're talking, um, allow for the data to be mapped. So when you free text something, uh, the software can't search a, a paragraph of what you wrote to say, you know, you gave the patient O2. Okay. where you have a drop down that shows your interventions, then that stuff can be mapped into the appropriate fields to where it's going. So my my specific thing is page five on the EPCRs. Define normal, because normal for you is going to be different than it is for me. That's true. And well, that, that whole assessment on page five, we yeah. should just eliminate the drop down boxes and then encourage the people to document physical assessment. Unfortunately, we can't with a lot of that as, uh, because of what you said. So. It gets into like yeah, yeah, you got you got two things you're trying to you're trying to <coughs> meet one requirement and then at the same time you're trying to cover your butt and provide good documentation. So I think the only way around it at this point in time is just to put as much as you can in the narrative. It's, and John, don't think that we're alone here with the EPCRs being like that. You look at an EHR and and let's say you're a OBGYN or something like that. They build them for primary care, so there's stuff that they're they're doing the same thing and they're kind of filling in blanks and it's, it's, a, it's a headache. You know, a lot of them have been developed to meet certain requirements for data requirements or mm -hmm. for federal funding or for Medicare or Medicaid, but they don't, they've yet to build anything that truly looks at workflow and, and has had somebody that's in the field develop it. We struggle with that in hospital all the time. The other, yep. the other problem that you have with that in the medical field is, um, and I, I see this, I see it uh, not with my own doctor, but uh, my 89-year-old mother complained to me bitterly the other day because she went to the doctor and the doctor never took her eyes off the screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Never once looked at her. Yep. Just asked her questions, and didn't lay a hand on her during an entire physical assessment. It all boils so. down to the fact that free tax fields are not searchable. I, I understand. So, I understand well, all that. I also work in another agency. We shut on the assessment page, we shut the drop-down boxes off because we found more bad documentation because of the drop-down boxes, where it was contradicting 
what they were saying in the comments. I, I, don't think, I don't agree with that. Deb, you have control over what start. the choices are in the drop down? Yeah. No, no, and we've had we've gone around and around at Remsco in regards to this because you're right, some have turned it off, and there's a whole debate as to whether or not that is really meeting the requ the federal requirements. Um, so I guess at this point, I would rather not get in trouble with the feds right now and go back to the fact that you just have to document, you know, and if there's something that you totally disagree with, say that in the negative. Just say the drop down box didn't really describe what I really saw. Sometimes right. there's not even options in the drop down box that you need. But you're no, forcing me to, you to, to pick something that's totally wrong. And then, and then, and yeah. I'm and really, really now, you know, I, so with, with all that, with all that said, not guys, nothing, yeah. nothing beats. With all, with all that said, nothing beats a great story. That's right. right. I understand that, but, uh -huh. you know, that's your, my whole point is, <laughs> for examples, when you have that drop down, and you've got nothing that matches similar. But you've got a comment under all of those. And you still have to select something out of the drop down. Is there so other, right. there other options? No. Not, not always. Not Sometimes always. the only, the best option is normal, which I, is not normal. Yeah. And the comments I guess say, I would be. It wasn't normal, like this other is And then require no. a, a comment. That would be great. I guess if there are specific, I, I'm willing to try this, okay? If there are specific categories, let us know what those are, okay? I will be willing to go and see if those are things that are required from the feds, all right? If it isn't, then we'll see what we can do to turn them off, all right? I mean, I'm fair, I'm fair to do that. Don't contradict yourself okay. in that page. Right. Right. Yeah. Which I understand. So if you give me those, I'll be willing to try to see that. Or could see yeah, narrative be a choice really so that they can write it down somewhere okay. else if there's not something. Right. But but if if you will give me that list of where of what they are, okay? Right. You know, print out a blank one, highlight it for me. I don't care what you do, give them to me, I'm willing to, to make that next step, okay? All right. I, I missed most of your presentation, I apologize. But, and I'm not sure if you covered the I know you covered the hearsay aspect early on in the lecture. Right. Uh -huh. Could you um, just kind of expound on that a little bit where, so if a witness tells us something, like a family member, should, that's hearsay essentially, unless they witnessed it or? It's, it's hearsay, so in other words, if a family member says to you, before he passed out, my father said X, technically that's hearsay because the definition of hearsay is an out of court statement offered or the truth of the matter asserted. If you write that in your PCR, quote, my father said as he passed out, don't you dare call 911. Okay, let's think of something that would really help us. And you put that in quotes, that's written in your PCR. Your PCR is a business record. Correct. So that becomes an exception to the hearsay rule. So that statement would come into evidence even though you couldn't sit on the witness stand and say the witness said to me this, but because you wrote it down and it's a business record and you have a duty to write that everything that a witness tells you about your patient's condition down, it becomes admissible as a business record. Mm -hmm. So what about like, let's say a different scenario, like maybe at, a, at two o'clock in the morning at a bar fight, you take a, <laughs> well, like a witness says, we probably shouldn't be putting that in our PCR. Then. If it, especially if it's something maybe negative against the person or... Well, you should avoid putting things in your PCRs that are not relevant to the patient care. Right. So, um, if... The, so maybe like how an injury occurred, if they're not, if they're giving us a story that's not accurate. How an injury occurred may or may not be relevant to patient care, but, you know, if, you know, for example, um, I saw somebody stab him twice, and you're looking at one stab wound could be very relevant for you to take another look and look for that stab wound that might be so small that you're not seeing it. Mm -hmm. the, the quote, the son of a bitch had it coming to him is probably not <laughs> something <laughs> in your PCR. I mean, to, to use a completely other, you know, opposite example. But so it is a judgment call based on what is relevant to the patient care and not relevant to the patient care. I don't know if you also covered this too, but I had a question on dementia patients and capacity. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, you did talk. Oh, you yeah, did? I mean, okay. you do, again, you know, anytime you're dealing with somebody who has a potential lack of capacity, uh, 
you shouldn't be refusing care for that patient unless there is a caregiver with them that's authorized to act like a proxy. Like a proxy. Um, and you do have to carefully describe uh, that your assessment of the person's capacity. And again, you're going to do that anyhow because if someone's severely demented, you're going to want to know, you're going to want to try to ascertain what, is this their baseline mental status or is there something else going on? So, so if we go to like a skilled nursing facility and it's documented on their medical record that they have a history of dementia and we ask the patient, you know, do you want to go to the hospital and they say no and we accept that as a refusal, we, we are basically potentially setting ourselves Correct. Right. Because once you have that many diagnosis to mention, you, you even have to address capacity. Even if they appear capacity. to be acting appropriately at that point in time, they can still Correct. be argued. Although, I, in that situation, I would ask to speak to the charge nurse or whoever was in charge of that patient's care and say, you know, I need some, you know, and I would document that I spoke with, fill in their name and their title, and they, person advised me that the patient is diagnosed with dementia and frequently uh, refuses to do things that are good for her. Some, some way of indicating that despite the patient appearing to be lucid, they are they're, they're suffering from dementia and they have a diagnosis of dementia. So, yeah. What about uh, accident scenes and what is the potential for a DWI charge? Um, is it a good idea the trooper or the officer tells you what their BAC is <coughs> via breathalyzer or if they ask you to obtain a blood sample from the patient? I don't think the region lets you draw blood mm -hmm. these days, yeah. right? No, we can. We can. We can if the question, but it's on us. It's, not it's on, on the agency. individual. Yeah, the I agency mean, is, is not, would not be held accountable. I would have, you know, I personally would avoid that uh, because, A, it's not related to the care of the patient. Okay, it's not like you're taking a blood sample because they're going to do a test on it and it's going to save your patient's life. B, uh, they could end up with a DWI charge, which is not your problem, but if you prick a nerve and they end up with nerve damage, it's going to come back on you. Uh, so I would be very cautious about doing any invasive procedure uh, at the request of a police officer. You know, be like, meet us at the hospital and deal with them there. What about documentation of a BAC on a... I mean, if the, if the trooper has them blow into the ALCO sensor, um, I think that's relevant to patient care. Um, so uh, the trooper's going to document that in his arrest report. So that's not going to come back on, no one's going <coughs> to accuse you of having convicted this person of DWI. Um, but I, I think you have an obligation anytime you think there's drugs or alcohol on board to document that thoroughly because you're, that's a relevant piece of information with regard to what anesthesia they could get on arrival at the ED. If they were going into surgery right away, it's a relevant piece of information for their mental status if they have a potential head injury. And so uh, you do need to document your observations uh, but I would stay away from doing blood draws. Uh, I mean, I, and I have. I, I got a call from rural metro Rochester a couple years ago at like midnight on my cell phone because some officer was threatening to arrest their crew for not drawing blood. And I was like, put him on the phone. Tell him if he arrests his crew, it'll be the end of his career. And he backed down. But um, but I would I would avoid getting involved in those sort of law enforcement scenarios. Okay. And on the same thing, well, now with the heroin and the opiate epidemics going on when, and everybody has Narcan at home. Right. We arrive on a scene of a potential overdose and now they're awake and they're refusing. Um, I've asked the DA's office and I've asked our county health commission, I've gotten two very different opinions as to whether they have the capacity to refuse or should they be considered a threat to themselves for knowingly ingesting a poison that can potentially kill them. Well, either way, it lets you off the hook because if they're a danger to themselves or others, then the only way that you can force them to go is 
via 941, and only a police officer can do that. Mm -hmm. um, you can strongly recommend to a police officer that they be 941. Um, that's the sort of refusal that I would be calling my supervisor, I'd be calling medical control, I'd be pushing that off on somebody other, some other decision maker, uh, and I would document the crap out of it. I mean, if I talked to medical control, I'd be like, I would want to make sure it was on a recorded line. I would advise fire control. I talk to medical control. I would document who the, doc the doctor's name. I would document everybody I talked to. I would document all my efforts to try to convince this patient that they needed to get checked out at the hospital because ultimately, ultimately when they fall out and die, someone's going to come after you and a family member could come after you and sue and I would want to be able to show them uh, extremely well documented. This is everything I did to try to convince I cannot put handcuffs on them and take them to the hospital against their will. And that's a fact. So, uh, you know, it, it, it again, it, it boils down to a little bit of your powers of persuasion or your ability to convince a police officer to do a 941 arrest, which is a crap load of paperwork for them, so they often don't like to do it. Mm -hmm. However, one of the things you can suggest to the police officer, and this actually worked in a head injury case I had out in, in Buffalo, where the patient did not, fell off a second floor porch, was documented by his coworker to be unconscious for two minutes, but was awake, alert, and oriented when EMS got there, was refusing to go to the hospital, and the police officer basically said, they convinced the police officer to threaten him with a 941 arrest, and he basically said, look, you can go with these guys, and if everything checks out okay, you could be home this afternoon watching college football, it was a Saturday morning, or you get 941 and you could be in for a 10-day commitment. And so he went, and ended up dying anyhow, but we got off, so. <laughs> um, I mean, it was one of those crazy situations where he was, he was, he, he was conscious and oriented. We took him to the hospital. First CT scan was absolutely normal. Um, by the time he was ready to be released, he was a little bit sleepy, so they convinced him to spend the night. The next day, the CT scan showed a diffuse bleed, and five days later, he was dead. So, um, but again, you know, we could, it was documented between our report and the police report, everything that was done to convince him to go. And, and that's the other reason for documenting carefully if other agencies are on the scene, okay? Um, again, uh, those other agencies all make out reports, and even though fires, fire doesn't necessarily make good reports, uh, you, can get, you can still get their CAD times or their dispatch times which can show you, which can help you demonstrate when first responders arrived, when it, if an AED was used, if CPR was started, um, and helps us together build that timeline of everything that occurred before you got there and everything that occurred after you got there. So again, documenting other agencies provides you with other witnesses that will, will hopefully support uh, our version of what occurred and hopefully their records will help us build that timeline. Yes, sir. Just two quick questions. The first one is with acronyms. Um, DCAP, BTLS, I know it's a common one that I've seen right. people use. Uh, which, how do you feel about that one being used? Is that acceptable to use on PCRs or not? Secretary? My understanding that, that uh, the region doesn't like any abbreviations right now, is that correct? They have a they have a list of yeah, regional yes. approved abbreviations which people modify right. <laughs> constantly. Um, you know, I, my feeling is if you're going to write DCAP BTLS down the side of your PCR and then make a notation by each one of them, you're probably okay. Uh, <coughs> writing negative DCAP BTLS uh, is, I think, going to be. I would much rather. Um, have you say, you know, did perform the detailed head-to-toe evaluation and found no evidence of, and write out the words, just, but. And, uh, and the second part was, uh, you said to obtain a, like, a witness signature from the fire department, right. did you do it? 
Would you prefer that be an EMT that had direct patient care with the patient before our arrival? Or would you prefer that be another firefighter on scene, say their officer or their uh, secondary member there? If it was another care provider, I would have it be the other care provider because if they are called to testify, they can probably do a better job of, of helping you describe, helping to describe the fact that uh, the patient was treated appropriately. but. Uh, if it was, you know, I'd rather see another firefighter or a fire officer or a law enforcement officer than the brother-in-law, because the brother-in-law is going to say, I didn't know what I was signing. I didn't read it. Um, another thing on that is, uh, if you do get a witness to sign or when the patient signs, I would document in my narrative that I explain the refusal form to the patient and the patient signed willingly. Yes, ma'am. Uh, third party calls where the patient is not aware that 911 was called, they didn't want you there, and they don't have a particular problem, like your bad neighbor thought you looked pale and called 911. Right. Is that a no patient found PCR, or is that still a you can die if we sign this piece of paper? Refusal? Well, that is a your patient, your neighbor obviously had some concerns. Do you mind if I do a quick assessment? Yes, I do mind. Don't touch me. Okay. Don't document that as no patient found. Okay. Document that as made contact with a presumptive patient, patient appeared conscious, alert, and oriented, patient refused my offers of assessment, patient indicated that they didn't call me, patient appeared, uh, you know, just, again, uh, I have seen lawsuits arise out of no patient found documentation time after time after time because, uh, Eventually, one of those patients, as soon as your back is turned, they will fall over and die, and, and then uh, you're going to want to show that you made every effort to try to at least let them, let you, or convince them to let you assess them. On that same line, with uh, minor 79s, possibly it's the uh, car accidents we get, and we show up, and it's a three-car minor fender bender. You got six people standing outside, and one's complaining neck pain, while the others say, "I'm fine." Should we be getting refusals on all of them, or where do we where do we stand there? Um. <laughs> there you go. That's a good answer. Uh, you know, I I think it, it's again gonna be a judgment call based on condition of the vehicles, um, the, the damage to the vehicles, the patients themselves. Um, you know, I, I think about that frequently as a fire chief because I'll show up on scene and people say, we're all fine, we don't need anybody. Mm -hmm. So I'll, do I cancel my ambulance or do I let my ambulance arrive on scene and let them make that decision? Um, Miami, I'm an EMT with Tully Ambulance. Do I carry a PCR in my glove box and do a quick refusal, or do I just say, okay, it's a 79 only? So I think it really depends on a, an individual judgment call. In, in an ideal world, you should take refusals from all seven people. But, uh, you know, in, an, in a less than ideal world, you're going to be in the middle of your third refusal and there's going to be a cardiac arrest and someone's going to die because you were taking refusals on somebody that uh, didn't really, was not not injured at all. So that's the rock and the hard place you're between. I have, not, I have yet to hear someone being sued because there was a delay because the ambulance was out doing a refusal, but I'm sure he'll arrive <laughs> sooner or later. <laughs> Refusals are a real concern. No, they, they they're, absolutely you know, are. They're, they're deadly dangerous. Yeah, they um, are. I mean, we've had some some phone calls that have come in because of their because of an issue with of the billing concern. That then there's comments that are being made, and you go back and you look at the documentation, and it just isn't there. Right. You know, and you just kind of sit there and hope to God that <laughs> I'm not going to be calling you. Well, and, and I mean, and that I mean, I have had a case where somebody was feverish and asleep and his mother called 911 and the crew showed up and he was awake and he said, I don't have anything to do with you and get out of here and we 
refused any offers, refused to sign anything, refused to have anything to do with them. At that point, he was so mad at his mom, his mom refused to sign anything. The crew left and uh, documented it as no patient found. And two hours later, he seized because he had a brain abscess. So, um, you know, again, uh, fortunately, we were able to show from the medical records that he'd had that abscess so long that it actually bored a hole in his brain. And she should have been going to his you know, doctor a long time before 911 was ever called. But again, you have a situation there where 